This was my title for my session that I wanted to kind of start talking to you about. We're going to start talking about the kind of the myths and challenges of social data. Now, I say burn it to the ground because I kind of felt like this about this point last year, and I was ready for not doing this at all anymore after analysing data since 2006. So I've been about for a while, um, but started to kind of feel a little bit. I suppose a little bit broken and a little bit frustrated about what was happening within the industry. One of the biggest things is that there's been no support in this industry. We've got all of these lovely vendors sitting and they'll give you all the training on how to use your tools and things, but they don't give you, there's not a lot of information and support to go beyond that. So we need to start bringing all this in today. And it starts here today, which is really incredibly exciting. So I'm really, really pleased to be part of it. And thanks again to Raoul for inviting me along. So, as I said, this time last year, I wanted to burn the whole thing to the ground. A few different things were happening. I was working with a lot of bigger clients, and I was still having to do a lot of manual analysis for the type of questions that we were answering. And the whole team was burnt out. Our clients were amazing, but I felt as though that I didn't want to do this anymore because, in fact, when I was looking at it, well, I felt a little bit lonely. I had an amazing team. We had amazing clients, but when we started to speak to other people about our work, nobody really got what it was that we did. They thought that we counted likes and clicks and all of this stuff, and we're just like, no, we've got so much stuff going on in here. We can get contextual understanding about audiences, we can find out all this really cool stuff. But people kept on coming back with their own assumptions about what was happening here. So we found it was quite lonely, and it wasn't until I started speaking to other people that I found that there's a lot of people who have responsibility for social data analysis who feel the same way. Um, even in the very large organisations, because it's not everybody that understands what, this, what it is that we're actually doing. Um, then, at the back end of last year, and the start of this year, came the moral dilemma, thanks to Cambridge Analytica. This has only been a little bit kind of more recently. So starting in May this year, and kind of ending up last week with another announcement, all the tools are buying each other. So we had Meltwater bought Sysimo Meltwater bought Sysimos, there's so many of them. My news desk bought Mention, um, Bandwatch bought Crimson Hexagon, which was the biggest shocker on earth. Um, Ipsos Mori bought Synthesio last week, and then we spread fast and lithium technologies are merging. So the industry seems to be cannibalizing itself, which is actually bringing up a lot more questions about whether or not there is a future for the industry. Is it going to be big enough or kind of what is going on here? So me digging into some of this stuff, it had to happen at some point because there's too many people kind of going about. Then when Facebook changed all their data API access, there was actually a lot of tools that went out of business. So the market is in a little bit of a flux, but all my market research friends tell me that it took 15 years for the online survey to get accepted. So we're about 13 years into social data. So the next couple of years are really, really important. So we'll expect a lot more changes to come along. Um, and I don't think we're going away anytime soon, or I've lost my career and my, all my life's research. <laughs> then we've got a bit more about those artificially intelligent futures. We're not going to have a job. It's going to be a robot that does all of this. There's all of these algorithms going about. <coughs> I don't think just now that any of those algorithms are strong enough to be able to take away any of our jobs. Um, we're still going to have to have a human there to analyse and interpret that data. And that is going to be our responsibility. So there is lots and lots of things kind of happening, people telling me different things that there's going to be no future. So I decided to start finding other people who analyse social data. And what I found was that there's actually a growing number of people out there who self-identify in their jobs as being social listening or in social intelligence, who have the main responsibility in their organisations for analysing social data. So I went and spoke to all of these people, and they told me so many amazing things. And like everybody here today, and like me back then, everybody was slightly frustrated with what was happening. There was lots of myths that they were sold in their jobs. There was lots of challenges. And then there was the future to look out for as well. So we're just going to go through a kind of few of the, there's so many myths out there, but I picked three today because we've got limited time. So you know, the first one, tools provide the insight. They don't. Every person in here provides the insight. The tools just provide the means to get to the data and manipulate it and analyse it. It's you that provides the insight. So 
when we're running off automated reports, they very rarely have the answer that we're looking for, particularly your C-suite. They don't want to see share of voice or sentiment. They want, they're looking for other things in there. And we can't get that from those automated reports. So we have to start digging a bit deeper and actually providing the interpretation to what's happening within the data. And then what I found as well was that, again, coming back to being misunderstood and nobody really understanding what it is that we're doing, and we all get th these people that I was speaking to were getting tired with, oh, you do social media strategy. And they were just like, actually, no, we do social media research. It's nothing to do with social media strategy. We can actually get to understand customers, and it can be used for all of these other things. But they were still kind of boxed in within this social media sphere. And they were kind of feeling as though nobody was really showing them their worth. So everybody was having these challenges. Do you have these challenges in your positions? A little bit? Okay, so we kind of need to start moving the conversation on. So, but then when we start looking at the things that were given, this is one of my favorite <laughs> graphics ever. This is in one of the social listening tools. And people put this into a report. Could anybody make any sense of what that's trying to tell you? No, a little bit? So this was from a good few years ago now. Um, and it was from the SSE Hydro, which is an event space, kind of like the O2, but it's based in Glasgow. And it was um, Peter Pan on ice, so it was like a kind of kids thing, um, Disney thing that was on. And the main character got down on one knee and he proposed to one of the other cast members. And this is all the conversation about this, all in different things, breaking it down into different words. Basically means nothing to us. Um, but we were finding that this was coming through in some of the, some of the reports that people were making. Then, when we start to look at other things and the automated metrics and breakdowns that were given from the tools, how would you begin to analyse that? I, uh, see if you start with me at work, day one you get something like this and to see how you would go approach and analyse it. Does anybody want to take a guess on how, you, how would you do that? Would you go in here, that peak? Any other takers? No. Nope. I would go the, the place the dot that is, is literally start falling down, so that middle. This one here? Yeah. Okay, so this is kind of a bit of a trick question for us. So I do, my work is all within social media research, so we're not looking for all the time, all the peaks and the troughs and everything. What we want to understand is what's happening day in, day out, and kind of what's the drivers and levers for these coming up and coming down. Because this, has been, this was for a project for Glasgow City Council where we're on trying to understand how people move throughout the city. Um, and this was a storm. And if all the traffic and all the congestion and everything went off and there was no trains or buses or whatever. So we kind of knew what was happening there, but what we needed to see was kind of what was happening day in, day out. And then once something happens, we know, we get to understand kind of what's the human impact and what's the behavior around that. But if you just go in here, we go, oh, that was a storm, and this is, this is what happened. So we need to find out what's going in day in, day out, which means, in fact, that we need to start breaking down the brand into its component parts. I call it deconstructing the brand, and then find, figuring out what people talk about quality, or if they talk about trust, or if they talk about, about breakages, and everything like that, just to understand more about what's happening in that data. Then when I was doing more research, what I found was is that from all those kind of social media case studies, um, the IPA Social Works, it's about 2014, 2015, they started to publish more case studies and things. And none of the case studies that looked at the ROI of social media actually used social media, to, uh, social media data to conduct the ROI analysis. It was all done through other research methods. So it's getting positioned back into kind of that social media sphere is not right. Then we kind of started to talk more about their challenges. Who should own social intelligence? In here, within the kind of yours, who's in marketing here? Quite a few people. Research? Some more? Is anyone in business intelligence? No. Anyone in analytics? No. Anyone in PR? Few people? You think we're all coming from different places, which means we all have a slightly different language round about this as well. So I would say social intelligence, some people would say social listening, some people might say social analytics, some people say social media research, and it goes on and on and on and on, which makes it really complicated to navigate through who's saying what and how it relates to me. And then 
I find out it's not just me that's doing the manual analysis. So we're paying hundreds of thousands of pounds sometimes for tools, but we're just using them to get the data, running them off into spreadsheets and doing the analysis that way. Crazy. Um, so it's so kind of where do, where do we go from that? How can we make those tools stronger? And then what I found was is that, again, because we're being pushed and sidekicked and no one really understands what we're doing, we want to have a bigger seat at the table. And there's some companies that I've spoken to, people like Unilever is a good example, um, Diageo is another good example, um, O2 is a good example of how they've been able to create their departments that based upon social intelligence and actually build them into the rest of the organisation and get a bigger seat at that table. But it starts by not doing the measuring and the counting and the automated reports and figuring out who it is that needs to know what. So there's lots and lots of things been happening. Everyone's frustrated, but hopefully now that we've started to have forums like this, that we can come together and start to navigate our way through. You don't need to feel lonely. You don't need to feel frustrated. We're all here to kind of learn and share today. So the truth about ROI. What I found when I spoke to these people and kind of from my own work as well, is that we need to go beyond the ideation stage. This is particularly evident when I spoke to quite a lot of the agencies and they were using social data to come up with campaign ideas and things. It's not the only place where social data has an impact. There's other parts of the organisation that we can have an impact too. And I'm going to show you some examples of my own work in a second. And don't just focus on the brand. Now, it's very well for me to say, and you guys sit in brands, and you need to understand about what's happening with you and your brand reputation and all of this. But when I start working with people, we do an outside in perspective. So it starts with the customer and it ends with the brand. And I'll show you why in a little minute. And then we need to have it integrated and not isolated. So if you're in your marketing department or your research department and that research is not going anywhere else, then we're not going to have a big impact as what it is that we want. And we're not going to be able to be taken credibly or get that bigger seat at the table. So let's have a look at this. This is one of the ways that I use social data with clients. Have you heard of conversion rate optimization before? So it's generally, and I say generally here, um, done with other alternative methods. So this is where people are looking to see if you can get from, you can complete an action quickly. So sometimes they'll move the button from one place to another, they'll change the color of it, they'll change the color of the text and they'll do all of this stuff. And I'm like, this is madness, because what happens if you have the wrong stuff on the page to begin with? You're only ever going to be able to optimise that based upon all the crap that's already there. So what I did, and this was from me going to buy a fridge freezer when, when I bought my first house. And I wanted to know, like, I've tried to buy this. Like, who's gonna, is anybody going to buy that? Is anybody going to read that? Probably not. And I went to lots and lots and lots of different websites. And what we were finding, what I was finding was more of this. And I'm like, this is not going to help me make a decision at all. So what I went to do was have a look at the decision-making heuristics that people use. So what's important for people to know before they go and buy a fridge freezer. And I'll take you through a bit of this journey. So this is the top of the page. Now, this was from a very well-known retailer on the high street. And then we had even more stuff going on there. I'm not looking at that and comparing 10 different fridge freezers. Like, nobody would do that. Um, then I went on for this one, and I had to look at the retailer, uh, the manufacturer's website to see what they saw, were selling about this. So they're telling me that this fridge freezer has super freezing and super cooling abilities. And again, that's not helping me make a decision at all. It's really nice to know, and it's great that like, they've got all of this kind of new technology and whatever in their fridge freezer, but that is not helping me make a choice. So having that taken up space on your website is not actually helping your customer, probably confusing them a little bit more. So I went and took a few thousand customer reviews to figure out what's important, what it is it that I need to know about these things before I make a decision. Can anybody guess at what's important beyond price? What it looks like. Pardon? What it looks like. What it looks like, yeah. We're very visual buyers, so I kind of took that out of the equation for this bit. Um, because once we've got that one, we'll do little checks to make sure that it's okay to buy. So someone said size. Who said size? Well done. So what we're finding is the relative size of the space is important. Not just the size that it needs to fit in, but actually what you can put in that fridge freezer. 
But all of these things are sold, and you can see that there. There's no woman food in it, so you don't know how big it is. It says it's 373 square litres, but unless you, like, you do a lot of measuring, you're not, you're not going to know how big that is. So we've got a bit of resistance here in, in a, a customer journey. So with that social data, we can figure out what it is we need to show people to help them make that decision quicker. So we like to design. We know how much food we can fit in it. Can we get our Christmas turkey in there? OK, that's good to go. Um, the next one, which no one has ever got, really, when I'm mentioning this, but it's noise. Noise is really, really important when we're buying white goods, but the manufacturers tend not to mention that at all in any of their literature. Now, we have like triple E ratings and all that for energy efficiency, so, but there's nothing to do with noise to help us decrease that kind of that purchase cycle. And then the last one kind of was the reliability. So when we're doing these kind of things, we're taking it out a little bit more and actually having a specific use case. So we're helping people shorten the life cycle. We're helping them actually get more in the basket. It's very difficult to buy white goods online. Most people go to a store and then they might go back and they will purchase online. But if we can start putting more things that we know the customer needs to see and hear in there, the higher the chance that is we're going to get them to convert. So instead of moving all these things round about, we actually go back and have a look to see what it is that they need to see because there was too much information there to, to start with. Now, the next one that I wanted to introduce you to this morning was my outside-in approach. So behaviour is my thing, and I analyse social media conversations to find out how people make decisions. So what I was finding when I was speaking to brands, and what you've probably been led to believe by a lot of vendors on the market, is you, make, you track your brand mentions, and this is what you need to do, and these are all the things that you need to see. What we do is we take it the other way round about. So our customer kind of sits out here. Now what happens in the way that we, people behave with brands is that all our behaviours and experiences are shaped from things that are external to that brand, and as they go down. So we've got society, kind of, our schooling, our home life and things like that dictate kind of how we behave and how we think about things because of our past experience. Then we've got you know, wider commerce. What's happening in other areas of commerce? Is it about, because this is why people go on about disruption, is it something about to hit us? We can figure this out from social data. Um, then we've got your industry and your direct competitors and finally your brand. So if, every touch point and experience that someone has with something else might shape their expectations and their needs and how they want to engage with you and what they want to see in your products and your services. To demonstrate this, there was some good research um, by John Poulsen from Lightspeed. And he did a survey, this was based upon a survey and it was called Will They Like It? And what they're demonstrating here is how social influence and all of these things that we're sharing in social media influences other people and how it is they purchase products. So this here was kind of pre-social media. So kind of homeware, FMCG and things, we weren't really influencing other people's buying decisions in these areas because we weren't really talking about these things. But we see them more and more often in social media and the social influence is starting to shape that. So in terms of identifying trends and what's happening, we can use social data to figure that out. This study found that um, pet sales had increased 20% over the past three years. And when we went to do some data analysis on the amount of people kind of with purchase intent for purchasing dogs and sharing dog images, we found out an upward trend in that as well. So we're being, we're, we're being shown more and more of these things on social media. And the thing was as well, with Christmas coming up, we found that there's been a 40% increase in Christmas decoration sales. And again, our purchase intent for things like that is increasing rapidly too, based upon social data. So we can use it to identify trends. This here, just to kind of come up and close, this was my favorite project that I've ever, ever done. So we were tasked by a bank um, to create customer personas. Now, I hate these customer personas. I'm Gillian and I'm 36 and I live in Glasgow and I have a cat and all that. Who cares? So what we wanted to do was understand how these different personas break out and how they make decisions to purchase credit. Now, it's likely that every single person in this room has got some kind of credit. Yep. Be that a mobile phone contract, be that a credit card, a loan, you know, whatever. To, unfortunately, in this country, to be able to get a mortgage, we need to have credit and everybody's driven to get a mortgage so everybody has credit at some point it's a kind of never ending cycle so what we wanted to do was understand who is purchasing credit and why 
Um, and we used, so I have 50 metrics that I use in social data, and these are a kind of few of them that we use for this particular project to be able to go down and to segment these customer personas. So we've got things like memories, kind of past experiences, because that shapes how we're going to then go and purchase a new product. And um, we've got fears and stress, um, anchoring. We've made something called the credit continuum for them, um, which we found because we had all these people saying that they weren't going to trust themselves with their credit card. They've got a £8,000 limit and they know that they're going to just spend that away. Um, so we're kind of finding these things coming out. I mean, the big thing that we found from this work was that customer personas are not static. They're transient. People navigate between one and the other depending upon their life cycle and in this case, how it is that they're managing and spending their money. Um, and then we came up with this. Um, so most people, when I talk to them, can actually kind of place themselves somewhere on here. So we've got the starters. This is where everybody starts out. We need to start with some kind of credit because we're kind of looking to... They can come on there. And again, it can be anything from a mobile phone right the way through to a loan and a mortgage. Then we can take a different direction depending upon how it is that we manage this money. Some people start to become reliant on that credit source and they live on the credit. And what we're seeing is that these people were surviving. And then something would happen or they would have a light bulb moment or something in their own environment would cause them to say, we need to start paying this back. We cannot exist like this anymore and they would become the dieters. And then from there, they would become the builders. Now, what we found when we looked at this psychologically is that these people were displaying the same psychological behaviors as yo-yo dieters. So they're living, they're doing all this stuff, no, 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 we need to change our ways, we need to change our ways. And then they get so far down the line and go, oh my God, we've been great, I'm just gonna go and buy myself this new coat. And then they go back round and round and round, and all these people are stuck in this cycle. Some of them make it out, and they can kind of come around a little bit more. Um, what we used this for with our client was to identify where they were on here and how they could maximize their customer lifetime value. It then went into buying, developing products and services and also in content as well. Um, and they, they use it quite a lot now. So we've got the, these people are probably the most interesting. Because what we're finding was with those people, they have thought that they were going to get the best credit limits and things because they maybe earned a good wage or they had been really good with their money. Um, but what we were finding was that not all of the time that they were getting that, and then they become really reticent because they weren't getting the 1.9%, they were getting 10.9%. Um, and the, the, so it was kind of being able to manage those types of behaviours in that transaction and kind of what, what could happen. And then we've got our end goers up here. So there's lots and lots and lots of ways in which we can use social data. They're just a few of the ones that I've worked on in the past year or so. Like I said before, the next two years of this journey into social data is extremely important. The market's changing, things are changing, there's going to be more training. Um, I'm on a quest to actually bring accredited training to you guys as well, because there's nothing, unless you're a data scientist, you've probably not been trained in how to use all of this data, because there's nothing exists just now. Um, so we're hoping to create that too. Um, everybody in this room is part of this journey. And you know, being able to bring and share these stories and everything is really, really important. So today is extremely important. Um, and it's up to you guys and kind of as well and how this journey kind of flows out because you're the people that are in the trenches and doing all the work too. Um, so I'm Dr. Julian May. I analyse social data to, um, to find out how people make decisions. I'm also the owner of the Social Intelligence Lab, which is the first content site and membership community, 100% dedicated to social data and insights. Basically, I made it for you guys, and this is how I managed to kind of get through my funk when I wanted to burn the whole thing to the ground this time last year. Um, we've just launched a new initiative. My personal opinion on this is that social data should be seen as a discipline in itself because we use the data slightly differently. Um, it shouldn't be a tack on to kind of marketing or a tack on to um, market research. We need to kind of develop and figure out a way to be able to self-regulate our industry before the government comes in and tells us we can't do anything anymore, um, which is quite a possibility. If you'd like to join, go to the SI Lab website. We're looking to kind of take on, hear other people's opinions and take on new members. Um, do stop by. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions just now. <laughs> Nothing? Is it uh, in its own um, depository of will or as part of a single customer view? It depends. 
Um, it depends on kind of what it depends on what we're doing. Um, we've the way that we the way that I've been I've been moving to do things is actually um, to do kind of a more macro analysis on it and just kind of deconstruct the brand and kind of figure out what's important to the brand and what people are seeing in amongst all of those diff uh, all of those um, all of those different points. So it, it changes quite a lot depending upon kind of what what it is that we're doing. And your preferred choices. Um, <laughs> I think it's probably it depend again it depends on the, I don't ha, I don't prefer one over the other and um, sometimes you can get I, I think the thing that I love about social data the most is that you can get these unexpected things that you didn't think you were going to get from the project which the transient customer personas was one of these things that and I've never heard anybody talk about that before and th th this was something that, that came out from there so there's positive and negatives to both it just depends on what you're trying to do with the insight at the end of the day depending upon kind of which focus you take anybody else you're all very quiet <laughs> hi Nick So within brands is driving the social intelligence beyond using the listening software? So Unilever have a massive department. I think, I can't even remember how many people are in that department now. Um, I know O2 for a number of years have been using social data in, in event detection. Um, Diageo have just been investing quite a lot of time and resource into building their own teams as well. What I found when I went to go and speak to all of these people is that a lot of the Fortune 500 are now starting to have their own social listening departments. Um, but what we're finding is that they're getting, maybe getting bounced about. So maybe for six months they'll be owned by marketing and then six months they'll be owned by research. So they're still trying to find where the value in it's coming from, um, which is kind of causing a, a few issues. But more and more people are moving towards that. Anybody? Yep. external um, like agencies do you think works well I think it depends upon it depends upon the resource and the experience that you've got in house and what it is that you want to do with the data because well, there's so many different places where it can sit so there's a lot of people who just purely use it for marketing and there's other people who use it for maybe market research and it's kind of coming into analytics and business intelligence now as well so it really depends there's no clear cut answer on it and um, I have a kind of few benchmarks and things that, we've, that we've, I've been doing a um, are doing a study just now. We're running a full-scale um, global benchmarking initiative, and um, so we'll be able to get some more of that. But it's not quite—it's not quite ready yet. Um, but give me your email address, and I can send that on to you. No more. You are so quiet. <laughs> well, I'll move on because um, you don't want to listen to me all all day. Um, can we move? There we go. So I want to introduce you now to Catherine Cook who is the Digital Insights Director at Mindshare. Um, like me, Catherine's been in social data for a very long time, for around eight years. Um, when we were talking earlier, we were kind of talking about what we thought the best insights that we've ever kind of gotten from social data, because I think that that helps people kind of understand a bit more about what it is that we do. But like me, Catherine likes the unknown unknowns. It's those things we didn't know we were going to find out before we started the project. Um, and Catherine's going to talk to us today about um, social listening for audience understanding. Now, I've always said that social data is in qualitative data, but on a quantitative scale. And in this session, Catherine's going to talk about the richness of social data to gain a nuanced qualitative understanding of audiences. Now, she's going to put this in the form of food. So she's going to make us all very hungry. So I hope you filled yourself up with breakfast just now. Um, but I'd like to welcome Catherine. Thank you.